You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. So we've talked a little bit about charities and supporting the veteran community uh, on this show, but what we haven't talked about is the support veterans provide to veterans and also how that support fits in with the overall idea society has about itself and how it fights wars. Commemoration is a very important part of a society's way of dealing with war. But can commemoration affect the way society deals with the way it treats its veterans and how much they are supported in their dealing with the experience of war? G'day listeners and welcome to the Dead Prussian Podcast, the only podcast named after a 19th century Prussian military theorist. I'm your host, Mick, your humblest host of a show named The Dead Prussian. Now, we have got a new program out. It's called the TDP Community Members Program. What it is, is a way for us to generate funds to keep the show going. Basically, I've got to be able to eat and sleep somewhere safe. So what we do is we have a Patreon membership. And if you go to patreon.com backslash the dead Prussian, you can see the members benefits you get. Primarily, we will provide transcripts uh, once we hit our fundraising goal for all the episodes we've had. All our guests also get a copy of their transcript, so that's kind of cool. And also we provide a monthly book club for certain subscribers. That has actually been going great guns and I want to thank uh, Jack McCain for jumping on as our first book club author to join the team. However, I'm not actually here today to talk about ways to make money to keep the show on the airwaves. I'm actually here to talk about commemoration, veteran support, and how commemoration affects the services of organisations that try and provide support to the veteran community and that connection that the wider society has with the experience of war. Where did I go to understand this? Well, of course, I went to the United States Study Centre because that makes a lot of sense. But when you find out who my guest is, then you'll understand. My guest today is James Brown, a former Australian Army officer, a veteran, and president of the Returned and Services League in New South Wales. He's also a director of RSL Life Care Limited and RSL Custodian Proprietary Limited. He's the chairman of the Anzac House Trust, deputy chair of the Anzac Memorial Trust, and a trustee of the RSL Welfare, Welfare and Benevolent Institute. After he left the ADF, that's the Australian Defence Force for those not in the great country, now, James worked as a management consultant before joining the Lowy Institute for International Policy between 2010 and 2014. His research and writing focused on Australian defence operations, policy and strategy. And in 2015, James was appointed to direct a program focused on the Australia-US alliance at the United States Studies Centre. That's where I am today and I've got to tell you ladies and gents, it is a lovely place to visit. Now, James's first book was an absolute cracker. It's one of my favourites on veterans' issues and commemoration. And it's titled Anzac's Long Shadow, The Cost of Our National Obsession. And it's published by Blacking Books in 2014. For those uh, listeners out there from the US who may have read books like Thank You For Your Service, it is of a similar genre, but in my opinion, a little bit more... Uh, critical of wider society as opposed to focusing on individuals and individual veterans. So it is worth a read. In 2016, he also wrote uh, the quarterly essay, Firing Line, Australians Path to War. And I've actually got both of them here. I'm going to convince him to sign them afterwards. Otherwise, I won't publish the episode. Now, James has studied economics at the University of Sydney and completed graduate studies in strategy at the University of New South Wales. That's one of my alma maters. And he is a graduate of the Royal Military College, Duntroon, just as all the best officers are. Now, James, thanks, firstly, for uh, actually letting me in the building, and uh, secondly, for appearing on the show. No problem. That was a really long intro. I'm going to yeah. get you to do that every time I go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I charge a small fee, but uh, I'm happy to walk around and do that. I like to beef out the intros just in case my questions are absolutely rubbish. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so... I'd imagine many of the Australian listeners, after the bio I just gave, or the Australian listeners who've actually keep a um, watch on current events and, uh, and some of the political commentary and particularly stuff related to the RSL at the moment, uh, have a little bit of an idea about you. 
Um, but the wider audience uh, may not, and that wider audience, not necessarily saying you're wider than us, America, as individuals, but as a population you are. Um, maybe you can give us a little bit of a background in how you came to find yourself leading an ex-service organisation such as RSL New South Wales. Sure. Uh, look, it's, it's, a, it's a strange and winding path, but uh, I left Defence in about 2010 after a period where I'd had a number of deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan and also done a little bit of work on the Solomon Islands mission as well. And I got to the point where I'd settled in Sydney and I could start to look at other community activities. So I joined the surf club at North Bondi and right next door was the RSL. Mm. And uh, I knew one person that worked there and I basically went and got involved at the local sub-branch level, uh, worked my way onto the committee, um, did this in my spare time and uh, it, it nested neatly with some of the thinking I was doing at the Lowy Institute as well and some of the thinking that mm. eventually led me to write Anzac's Long Shadow. Uh, and then um, a few years later, last year, or sorry, 2016, I, um, I, I had become uh, pretty frustrated with where the RSL was going and, yeah. and I threw my hat in the ring to, to be the president uh, in a casual election. I didn't win that election, um, but in 2017 I was um, elected to, to lead yeah. the organisation, which has got about 40,000 members and is going through some tough times at the moment. Yeah, and for those Australians uh, listening, uh, jump online, read uh, abc.net.au. Actually, you don't have to be Australian, but um, they've done some news coverage of recent events over the past week because the Bergen Report, which is an inquiry into um, RSL New South Wales, has recently been uh, released. Uh, 700 pages. I imagine that was a fun read uh, for yourself. Um, but uh, we're actually not going to go too deep into it, ladies and gents, because it's 700 pages and you know how lazy I am when it comes to reading. <laughs> Um, I'd rather chat about something I've already read because that makes it easier on me. And, uh, and I want to talk about the legacy of commemoration and how it impacts uh, organisations and also society in the way they support veterans and their families. And my first question uh, relates pretty closely to your book, Anzac's Long Shadow, which is probably one of the best names for a book uh, ever. I'm certainly hoping that you came up with that. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry to say I didn't. Uh, <laughs> that, that was the editor. Uh, my wife came up with the cover, but um, I, I managed to fill, fill out the bookends. And for those listeners who haven't seen the cover, it's a, uh, it's a picture of a, a statue. So that's pretty good. And I'm disappointed to see that your version was on sale. That's yeah, very no, sad. I, I didn't buy it until it was on sale. Um, but that's because I'm cheap, not because of the quality of the book. <laughs> Actually, for those listeners who are ABC fans, I waited until the ABC was going out of business for the ABC shops. I went in there with a, uh, with a trolley and pretty much cleaned them out. <laughs> but enough about my cheapness. Um, so what inspired you to write Anzac's Long Shadow? Look, I, I had... Uh, got to the position where I had left the military, I had spent about six months working in the, in the private sector and I had gone to the Lowy Institute to work as a, as a research associate at that point and then later a research fellow focusing on military and defence issues. And yeah. it was a role I convinced them to create. And in 2010, uh, the Australian government was debating the war in Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, the then Prime Minister Julia Gillard had uh, kicked it off, and I, I, you know, I was still working at KPMG and and trying to watch the um, debate, and ended up doing a little bit of media commentary on the debate. Mm. And I watched politician after politician stand up to talk about what we were doing in Afghanistan, and it became clear to me that none of them had a clue. Really, yeah. they were reaching for. Uh, the sort of speeches you would give on Anzac Day, but they were pretty generic. Mm -hmm. In most cases, you could have changed out the name of the country and put in Iraq or the Solomons or East Timor, and it wouldn't have changed the content of the speech. And so I wanted to understand how was it that we had been at war for so long, mm -hmm. and yet the level of debate about what we were trying to achieve and how we were trying to achieve it and the cost of what we were trying to achieve was at such a basic level. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you had a panel looking at how to commemorate 100 years since the Anzac um, operation, and that included former prime ministers and luminaries, yeah. and was being funded to an extraordinary degree and was catching the imagination of the public. And I just couldn't understand how those two things could sit side by side. How could you have a public that had no idea what had been happening in Afghanistan or what our soldiers were doing or where it was going? Mm. 
and yet so much energy and investment going into this centeneration of something that happened 100 years ago. And that's what led me to start thinking about the book. It took me a couple of years to think it through and then I wrote it over the course of about six, seven weeks in oh, 2013. Wow. It's, uh, it's quite an effort uh, to get it out, uh, written so quick. But then again, I suppose if you're thinking about it for a while, all you've got to do is just, you know, write it. I mean, they do say writing books is really, really easy. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, particularly ones on topical issues. It's interesting you talk about the the commemoration, the committee that was set up, and the and and the funding that's gone into the centenary of Anzac. And uh, I've been a little critical of it on this show before, particularly when I questioned the um, and interviewed some of my uh, war memorial historian friends. Um, and, you know, I always ask them, and I like to talk with uh, historians who are outside the World War I area or the First World War. Sorry for those Australian and British listeners. I won't use the American term anymore. Uh, but what are they going to do next year is my big question, you know. Um, and I think one of, uh, one of the show's favourite uh, guests and listeners, uh, Peter Dean, has estimated that he, as a World War II historian, will be just a, probably alive, Pete, probably, just slow down on the uh, burgers and beers um, when World War II centenary comes. There you go, Americans, World War II. And, uh, and it's going to be interesting because he says that's his comeuppance. He's going he's to try and commemorate it. But it is amazing to see the public interaction with the centenary of Anzac um, is, is, is quite uh, phenomenal at the War Memorial. I know that their attendance yeah. is quite large. Um, being at the last post ceremony for the uh, centenary from Mel um, and, and reading the ode there, I was amazed at the number of people that were there. And, mm. uh, and it's interesting when we then have things like the commemoration of Operation Slipper Parade and, and those sorts of things recently, um, but the level st of buy-in still isn't there because of this mythology. And uh, one of the issues you address in the book is commemoration and how it affects society's views of the modern veteran. Uh, which I think links directly to what you are talking about before. So how do you think the focus on Anzac and its associated mythology affects our understanding of the modern veteran? Yeah, it's, and it's interesting, you know, this has changed actually quite a lot since 2014 during the period that we've, we've been celebrating, commemorating the centenary of, mm. of Anzac. Uh, when I wrote the book, I thought, you know, it was incredibly controversial and I thought I'd get heavily criticised for it. And now yeah. a lot of the messages in the book almost feel like conventional wisdom. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this was something that just wasn't on the radar for most Australians. Uh, they were comfortable with the way we commemorated Gallipoli, which in itself was a pretty recent phenomenon, mm. uh, starting really from the early 90s when Bob Hawke took veterans there to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the landings. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, most of the public were uh, really focused on Anzac Day in, in a good way, and there's a lot that's good about it, uh, focused on the sort of Australian way of telling that history, which is very much about the individuals and very much about the soldiers rather than the officers and very much about the tactics rather than the strategy. Mm. And uh, that was the, the, the narrative, uh, a narrative of sacrifice, uh, a narrative that said that Australians perform well, but were let down by uh, their British commanders and the British strategists, and you know there's certainly some truth to that. Mm. But to me, I, I got the sense that we weren't using all of this extraordinary energy and, and fantastic energy that uh, respects the role that veterans have played. We weren't putting that to any purpose. Mm -hmm. It was disconnected from the purpose. Yeah. And if Australians were as concerned about the unnecessary loss of military life, as the Anzac legend would suggest, then why weren't they having a more critical debate about the future of the Defence Force and about mm. how we should protect our soldiers, sailors, aircraft men and aircraft women in the future? Mm. It's, it's interesting when you, you talk about you know, the focus on the, um, the, the, the waste of lives uh, because we see that uh, you know, Australians always talk about Gallipoli and you know, Australians dying on the on the shores uh, of Gallipoli because of British um, stuff-ups, because this is a very clean show. I might use the other term for that, but I think uh, most people can understand a word that uh, starts with F. Um, and then, then we move to modern day, and uh, you know, Australia's tolerance for casualties in a place like Afghanistan or, uh, is quite low uh, in terms of the Australian public, but uh, it never seems to follow with a public debate about the purpose. And you mentioned that you know today the book feels like uh, conventional wisdom uh, to a degree, and you know 
I would I would argue that you, you, you're pretty correct in that. Um, society seems to have gotten on board. Um, the RSL is going through a pretty uh, tumultuous time at the moment. So um, now that you're in the hot seat, you know this is almost what I like to call the HR McMaster trap. <laughs> um, you know you've written the book on it. And then someone pretty much, you get the job and someone goes, well, you told us how you're going to fix it, now fix it. Um, so, you know, not just the challenges for yourself, not just the challenges for RSL New South Wales. I suppose we can broad look at ex-service organisations, but, you know, RSL New South Wales is a great microcosm to study. What challenges lie ahead for organisations, ex-service organisations, in gaining community support for veterans? Um, not just based on the mythology, but also when they lose support, which is something very real to your organisation at the moment. Yeah, and look, you're absolutely right about the HR McMaster trap. Uh, Anzac's Long Shadow had a chapter that talked about the issues with the RSL that called on the New South Wales government to investigate the RSL uh, and, and lead it to reform. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, four years later, I, I get the hospital pass to um, take this <laughs> century-old institution uh, through a seven-week um, public inquiry into corruption and mismanagement issues. So, yeah. um, and in fact, the Bergen report quotes Anzac's long shadow. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, so look, it's it's a challenge um, to now own the problem and do something about it. But it's a pretty tremendous opportunity as well. I mean, the RSL is along with Legacy, the premier organisation in Australia dedicated to helping veterans. Yeah. Uh, it, it has several hundred thousand members around the country, 40,000 at least here in New South Wales with another 20,000 associated volunteers. And it's had a long history of protecting the rights of veterans and, and lobbying the government to protect the rights of veterans. It's got a presence in every town, city and suburb in this state. Yeah. Uh, and the people who have an association with it hold it very dear indeed. So to have, to have this period where for 10 years it it's lost its way, it mm. creates some challenges. But I think what we have this year is a window of opportunity to reform the way we think about veterans in Australia. Yeah. It is the end of the commemoration period for the First World War. Mm -hmm. It is uh, a year in which Sydney will host the Invictus Games uh, later in October. There will be an enormous amount of attention and goodwill towards veterans. It's also a time when the Department of Veterans Affairs is reflecting pretty critically on how it does business yeah. uh, and on how it organises itself and, and really on the, on the best way to help veterans and moving away from a culture of compensation where, yeah. where veterans basically say, I want a check from the government to fix my problems and that's yeah. the end of it, <laughs> to, to more of a culture of treatment and transition. And that creates a really exciting window there is a critical need for reform. Uh, as, as research by Andrew Condon pointed out, there used to be, uh, a couple of years ago, 3,500 organisations registered uh, as charities supporting veterans in some way. Wow. Now there are 5,000. And, and the reason for that is that uh, the RSL has not led the sector. Yeah. There are a lot of smaller charities popping up, duplication of services, yeah. lack of professionalism. Uh, so there is a need for the veteran sector to consolidate mm. uh, and work together. So it makes it an exciting year, but if we don't get it done this year, the spotlight will move on and, and you know um, cynicism will set in. So that's the big challenge, not mm -hmm. just to turn around the RSL in New South Wales, but I think for all of us to take an interest and turn around the way we look after veterans in Australia. Mm. And it's worth noting the RSL has been around for over 100 years now. I think I think it was 2016 was the centenary maybe. National centenary was 2016. Yeah. New yeah. South Wales last year. Excellent. So what, so, what a way to mark it. <laughs> yes. But yeah, you know, I, I suppose the point is that it's it's an organisation that has a, a vast institutional memory. Yeah. Um, and there are periods in Australia's history where the veterans have integrated in the society reasonably well. And I guess, you know, what better organisation than an organisation was around when that happened? And look, it's fascinating. I've been looking at the history and you see, uh, I look at a picture of um, all the VC winners that were in the RSL uh, in 1919. Yeah. And I just wasn't expecting to see a room full of really young looking guys. Yeah. And I've been reading on what some of the veterans were doing in 1945, 1946, and they talk about, you know, a family-friendly RSL uh, with a creche that yeah. can look after the kids, a place where 
ex-service women and ex-service men can be equally welcome and yeah. um, engagement with the media, helping find jobs. So quite progressive, actually. Yeah. Um, and uh, an organisation for which they had really high hopes. Uh, so I think all, all the good elements of that are still there. There are still lots of people who want to serve uh, yeah. again once they leave defence and, yeah. and who want that camaraderie that they had in military life yeah. and who want to make sure the public uh, is reminded through commemoration that veterans have a special place in our Commonwealth. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating topic, um, particularly for those listeners uh, from Australia. I'm not going to alienate my international audience. Ironically, uh, my international audience is actually larger than my Australian audience, but that's uh, mainly due to tall poppy syndrome and poppy's relevant to commemoration as well. Now, I, I would love to sit here and dis discuss this all day, but um, yeah, I'm on my lunch break, so um, yeah, I'll have to get back to work. And also, um, this is a really cool building and I want to check it out. So James, we have to go to the final question. Now, this is what uh, I call paying the butcher's bill, which is yeah, a, a bit of a bloody term um, for war, but it's uh, how the interviews uh, get paid for by the guests. So if you want to come on the show, actually no one ever contacts me and says, can I come on your show? I contact <laughs> everyone else and then I beg. But regardless, there's still a bill to be paid. And that is uh, finishing a sentence that we use to frame our debate on war and warfare. Uh, it is the sentence we use to continue the conversation uh, that we consider was started very well by the dead Prussian himself, Big Carl, uh, in questioning a society's understanding of war and its study of war. So our understanding of war is, is framed by how each of our guests define it. So I invite you to offer a definition and engage in this debate by finishing the sentence, war is. War is not yet extinct. Um, but I think that is particularly important for Australians to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are a country where you don't often see people in uniform carrying weapons. You don't often see people carrying weapons full stop. Yeah. Uh, we're a long way from anywhere. We haven't had a lot of major civil wars here. And I think we forget that the military is not just there for Anzac Day. The military is there to defend our way of life and defend our freedoms and values. And it's sometimes a challenge to get Australians to think about that when we're in a place that you know has beaches, big skies, and and, uh, and not, not a lot of violence. Yeah. War is not yet extinct, and the best thing is, well, I guess Twitter doesn't matter anymore now that they've expanded and tried to become Facebook with their 280 characters, but war is not yet extinct is a great uh, tweet that I probably still won't tweet out because I always forget to tweet when we do the show promotion. Um, great podcast host, terrible marketer. Um, now, James, thank you very much for coming on the show, um, thank, taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, for those listeners, you know, this... I joke that it's during my lunch break, but it's also a very busy time uh, for James, who's mentioned the, the Bergen Inquiry that came out last week. Um, and as you heard from the bio, he's pretty much involved in anything that happens in New South Wales anyway. Um, so how can you support James? Listeners, you can follow him on Twitter, at Captain Brown. Uh, you can follow his Facebook page, uh, the president of the RSL New South Wales page. So jump on uh, Facebook, chuck in search bar, uh, James Brown, uh, RSL New South Wales President, you'll find it. And you can also, most importantly, go out there and buy his book. Try not to find it on sale because uh, he's legitimately dirty at me. Uh, but Anzac's Long Shadow, uh, it's the red back number four produced by Black Ink Books. And also, uh, we didn't discuss it too much, uh, but there is also the quarterly essay firing line. And it talks about Australia's path to war and how uh, Australia... Uh, decides and goes to war and, and what sort of challenges we can expect coming up. So uh, have, a, have a read of all those. Uh, engage with James on Twitter. He's quite good at engaging on Twitter. That's how I was able to uh, link him into this. But uh, James, thanks very much for coming on the show. No, it's a, it's a real privilege and keep up the good work. And listeners, you can keep up the good work by helping us out with the Patre Patreon page. Uh, if you want to be a member, you also get bonus episodes. I don't mention this often, but I actually do do extra episodes for those members of the TDP community. Uh, those people who are already members know that I've used a fictional trilogy to discuss strategy and different types of forces. And we're also currently in the middle of a uh, specific series focusing on violence and violent behaviour from not just an international relations and history sense, but also from a criminological and psychological sense because I've actually got to put those other degrees I have to use. But until this next time, listeners, grab a book. Mm.
and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution Licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.